thanks, Tim, and I thank you for bringing up my, my past. Uh, it's good of you not to hold it against me. I do hold it against myself, because for the uh, three years that I spent in the British Communist Party, not very active, I have since developed a deep sense of shame. But there you go. That's what it's like in the early 20s, at least in that time. Uh, and it's somewhat far behind. I should have been here last month. And for those of you who turned up to hear me then, my apologies. Uh, I was saying to our colleagues before that uh, the reason I didn't come was I went to Stansted and had forgotten my passport. And as a former foreign correspondent, I felt deeply, deeply stupid, uh, but could do nothing about it. They did not accept the fact that a driving license would get me into the Republic of Ireland. So my apologies. Uh, I'm glad to see a former colleague from Moscow here, Seamus Martin, who covered uh, um, the Soviet Union and Russia uh, for the Irish Times, around about the same time uh, as I did. Uh, both of us had the same, I think, experience. We were, we were told to go to cover one country, the USSR, the Soviet Union, and ended up covering 15. We went from, actually not I, I and I think probably not Seamus, but the, those who covered the Soviet Union from, the, from Western uh, uh, newspapers and TV and so on, would do things like count uh, the number of people on the podium on the Lenin's tomb when they took the march past for the May Day Parade to find out who was next to whom and therefore who was up and who was down in the Kremlin. And that kind of Kremlinology, which was part of scholars uh, as well as of, of journalists' activities, were replaced by wondering whether or not, as I did, and I think many people had the same experience, whether or not it was worth leaving Moscow to go to Riga in Latvia to see the opening of the new Latvian parliament and the swearing in of the first independent Latvian government for many, many decades, a world event. But so many world events were packed into these years of 89, 90, 91, uh, 92, and then, of course, the chaos that succeeded the end of the Soviet Union, that you began to get a bit blasé. Uh, you, uh, another world-shaking event, well, I don't know, uh, should I go or not? And in that period, uh, much of the, the, the 90s, from 91 onward in, in Russia, I was there for six years covering the last year and a half of Gorbachev and the first more or less five of Boris Yeltsin. It was a country whose leadership, both Mikhail Gorbachev bringing in Glasnost, opening one translation of it, and Perestroika, a reconstruction of the of the economy, not to make it capitalist, but to make it more efficient as socialism. And then succeeded by Boris Yeltsin, who dug, dug underneath the foundations that Gorbachev was trying to make, both for himself and for the Soviet Union. And finally, uh, after an unsuccessful coup against Gorbachev, finally succeeded him and uh, uh, succeeded in breaking up the Soviet Union into its 15 constituent republics. In that period, the period when, when we were there, especially the first four, five, six years, the assumption was, the correct assumption was, that the politics which the new leadership were following were broadly speaking towards a liberal democracy. Never got there, but it was towards a liberal democracy. Uh, and uh, it was pro-European. You'll remember, perhaps, some of you, that one of Mikhail Gorbachev's slogans which was echoed by, uh, by Boris Yeltsin, was for the creation of a common European home. Um, that Yeltsin, I think uh, Gorbachev was the first to put that phrase uh, into common political parlance. He saw Europe, he saw Russia, the Soviet Union, or much of it within in Europe, and saw the common European home, by which he meant that we, we all of us, we Europeans, and of course he included the Americans, perhaps the whole of the world, had to get over this cleavage which the Cold War had imposed upon us and see the common values and the common problems and come to some kind of common action to deal with these problems. But Putin's period, from the 2000s onwards, the last decade and a half, has been quite different, which is what I want to speak about, 
Um, I take the place now, luckily, in a way that, lucky that I didn't come last time in one sense, because I was able, uh, my, my guilt impelled me to come whenever I was asked, and um, Andrew Gilmore asked me to come to take the place of Dmitry Trenin, who was to be here. Uh, um, I know Dmitry well, he's head of the Carnegie uh, office in, in Moscow, has been for some time. He um, was a former military intelligence um, officer and then became a, a, um, an analyst, one of the best, I think, post-Soviet analysts. Um, but he fears, and feared then, when he was supposed to come, that Carnegie might be in the, the, the sights of the Kremlin for closure and decided he should come. In the past uh, three years, laws have been passed in Russia which severely limit the activities of the NGOs and other institutions with links abroad. The foreign agents law, the Inustrani Agent, which, uh, which in Russian sounds more sinister than it does in English, because the Inustrani Agent, the foreign agent, was regarded as the viper in the, in the bosom of the Soviet state. Um, NGOs which take money from abroad and which operate in a very, very broadly defined political space are named as foreign agents uh, and um, their funds are cut off. The NGO which, uh, which I'm chairman of, uh, I didn't create it, it was created by two Russians and I was in Russia at the time and became friendly with them and supported it, um, uh, was originally called the Moscow School of Political Studies, which somewhat right squarely in the middle of the uh, of what the Kremlin most hated, we renamed ourselves somewhat clumsily and late into the Moscow School of Civic Enlightenment in order to get a bit of what you might call Vol Voltairean gloss onto what we were doing, but it didn't fool, fool anybody. And um, a few months ago, after a number of appeals, the money was frozen, which meant, essentially, since most of our money did come from abroad, uh, we could no longer operate, and we're now trying to operate <coughs> excuse me, outside of, of Russia and the donors, who include George Soros, who has given so much of his money. He's got a lot of money, but he's given an awful lot of it away to support um, institutions like that in, in the former Soviet Union, in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. He's continuing to support with others, and we hope to keep it going in some, in some way. At the same time, another law was passed only a couple of months ago, uh, which um, sees, which allows or, or seems to be about to allow the government to close um, foreign NGOs, um, uh, which were regarded as undesirable, legislatively instituti, uh, undesirable. What does undesirable mean? Well, it means what you want it to mean. It means that if you don't like the Carnegie Institute or Human Rights Watch office, which has an office in Moscow, then uh, you say it's, it's uh, undesirable and it's closed rather than the way that the Russian NGOs, of which the one that, uh, that I'm associated with was one, um, was, was also closed. The money will be stopped, the, um, the premises taken away, and the work no longer allowed. So uh, that's part of the backdrop of what's now happening in Russia. There's much more, of course. These laws have to be taken together with, as you will all know, um, but just to go through it briefly, the seizing of Crimea, the southern part of Ukraine, the sponsorship and provision of troops and weaponry to Novaya Russia, the, that part of eastern Ukraine around the Donbass <coughs> coal and steel area. And we speak on the anniversary of the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner uh, MH17 with the loss of, I think, some 300 lives, nearly half of them Dutch, uh, the rest Malaysian. Uh, and the anniversary is today. Russia still denies any part in it, although it's generally accepted that the the, um, the rockets, the anti-aircraft rockets which they supplied to the rebels which they sponsor were responsible for the shooting down. 
the threats to the Baltic states, which Russia has made continually and continues to make, the large new resources that it's um, devoting even now as the economy shrinks and, and in some ways is shrinking quite dramatically down to five, six, seven percent negative growth. Still, it's devoting large new resources to the military, the army, the air force, and the, uh, and, and the navy. And the very high volume of propaganda, both through Russia today, the uh, English language, it's also in Arabic and other languages, Spanish, I think, uh, but even more virulently, much more virulently within Russia, where uh, people like um, a man called Kisilov, who's one of the main chat show hosts, um, uh, threatens to annihilate America with nuclear bombs, conduct a war, which, he, which seems to be one of his particular obsessions um, against, uh, against gays, uh, which he sees as a sign of Western decadence, and amplifies the, um, the, the speeches of Vladimir Putin, of the president, that the West is both decadent and threatening. So we're a decadent threat. The two are encompassed in one. The rationale which the Kremlin puts out for this is that it is manifold. And some of it is correct. One, uh, this is not correct, I think, uh, is that NATO had promised Gorbachev way back, um, nearly 20 years ago, um, not to expand into any part of the former Soviet space, or indeed even into the former Comic-Con space, East Central Europe. Uh, and they reneged on that. That's the, that's the charge. And that Russia is surrounded by NATO bases um, in north the, the Baltics, though until recently there's been no major NATO base there. Uh, and in the south, uh, uh, Turkey. That the West has stimulated, and this in a way is the most serious charge, I think, or seen to be the most serious by the Kremlin, that the West has stimulated um, uh, anti-Russian movements in Moldova some time ago, in Georgia, uh, um, where, of course, the Russians invaded now, nearly 10 years ago now, um, after the Georgians tried to get back some of their territory, Abkhazia and North Ossetia, and most importantly of all, centrally important, Ukraine. Ukraine, centrally important to Russia, by far the biggest of the uh, Soviet republics after Russia, Slav uh, as, as Russia, um, regarded essentially during the Russian imperial period and during the Soviet period as essentially part of Russia, a language which is more or less comprehensible uh, by Russians, vice versa. Um, a, integral part of the, the Soviet economy and to a degree still of the Russian economy because of the, the coal, the steel, and the, the weapons and, and aviation industry that uh, Ukraine had and to a lessening degree still has. So that, that the charge is that the West stimulated the Orange Revolution in Kiev and um, forced the fleeing, really, not just the resignation, but the fleeing of the former president Yanukovych, um, and installed what is said to be, the, the European Union installed a Nazi or a fascist government led by President Poroshenko. There's a, um, a in today's Times, uh, the, the London Times, there's a, an interview with uh, Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who's the prime minister of Ukraine, who um, uh, said that he is convinced that Russia wishes to, to end all, pretend, all possibility of, a, of an independent Ukraine, and says that everything points to a new confrontation on Europe's eastern border. That's Ukraine's eastern border. He says, from classified and unclassified sources and satellite images, you can easily see that Russia has stationed tens of thousands of troops and Russian-led guerrillas in Donetsk and Luhansk, the two, major, two of the major cities in this area, now called Novaya Russia, New Russia, in the, the, the Donbass. They are still supplying tanks, howitzers, uh, even surface-to-air missiles. Russia has created a massive military group in the east of Ukraine. And he goes on to say that the truce, which is essentially being broken all the time, but with relatively minor skir skirmishes, will break down in a big way 
by, by the, the end of, of autumn, and fighting will again resume in, in August. And um, the, uh, the NGOs in Russia um, are su supported by the West, um, as I said before, are spreading, are also spreading anti-Russian propaganda from right within the country itself. This is the charge, and Western NGOs um, spread Western propaganda throughout, both throughout Russia and throughout the former Soviet Union. The Moscow School, which I was associated with, was founded at the end of the, the Soviet period, but before the Soviet Union collapsed, explicitly to, as, a, as a kind of a civic education organization. The two people who founded it, a uh, married couple, she, was, she is an art historian, he a philosopher, came to the view that Russia had never really had uh, any kind of democracy or real civil society, um, and therefore uh, um, both a broadening of the Russian mind and an education of Russian civic habits was essential, and uh, it got a good deal of money from abroad. This was when Russia was receiving a lot of money, not just from, from George Soros, but from many quarters and from governments, uh, and built up a big network of seminars, conferences, publications, and, um, and supporters, and brought in people from abroad um, to speak to, to, to debate with Russians. And it wasn't a one-way street. At first, it, it was a bit, because um, the West was regarded as by some, especially the, the young intelligentsia, as the source of all wisdom. They soon realized it was not, and we, we had a debate. And it was often very fierce, especially when there was an invasion, um, the, the, the Western, the NATO uh, uh, war battle against the Serbians, the Serbians' traditional ally of Russia, the Soviet Union. Uh, lots of disagreement about that. More recently, big disagreements about Syria and the su and support of the, re of the rebels or support of, of the Assad regime. So it isn't a one-way street, but it is a dialogue or a, or a multi-logue. A, a place in which arguments and, uh, and debates and, um, and new propositions can be heard. Uh, and we had a, a large number of distinguished people coming to these debates on both sides, both um, distinguished Russians and other former Soviets, Georgians, Ukrainians, and so on, and also people from the United States, from Europe, and from elsewhere. I got Boris Johnson to come, um, and this was, I think, before he, certainly before he was mayor of, of, um, of London, I think he perhaps was a Tory MP, but he already was regarded as being the coming man, the, the man who sooner or later would transform himself from being, a, uh, from being a political clown into being the leader of the Conservative Party and, and possibly of the country, if not Europe and the world. And I got him to come, and he spent quite a lot of long time, quite a lot of time with others in the bar. He came and, and gave his talk, and he looked at these 150 Russians in this long, rather, rather inconvenient room which we gave talks in. Uh, there was, of course, a, a simultaneous translation, and he looked at them and said, I'm going to talk to you today about the British sausage. <laughs> and there were you know, people looking, and they got was the translation right, the British sausage. He said, I'm going to tell you why the British sausage is under threat. It's under threat by Brussels. It's Brussels wants to make it straight. And, and after a while of going on like this, I was sitting by the translator's booth. And the guy whom I knew came out and said, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't make sense of this. <laughs> I said, well, don't, don't just translate it as it comes. Because uh, nobody else is making sense of it, least of all him. But it was... It was Boris at full flood, and actually after 10 minutes, one saw the, the, the leadership potential of Boris Johnson because people were laughing without hearing the translation because he was so expressive, his hair flopping, his arms going, and his, his face purple with a kind of um, uh, pseudo-indignation, and he went down extremely well. He could have been president of Russia had he, had he stayed. Uh, that, that unique, unique place, the Moscow School, is now kicked out of Russia. It may, I hope, survive, but, but who knows. <laughs>
Russia, and this, I wanted to put this out to see what you made, made of this. I don't know if it's, it's a rather tentative thing, but I think that Russia, to some extent at least, acts in lockstep with other authoritarian countries. And is seen, uh, Vladimir Putin is seen as someone whom other leaders can take a lesson from, uh, as he took lessons from Silvia Berlusconi, um, all kinds of lessons, but, but uh, one of them at least that you have to dominate the media, uh, and insofar as you can, own it. In a sense, he does own it because the dominant media in everywhere is television, and it's, it's all under Kremlin control. And so news is uh, all, nearly always begins with whatever the president is doing that day. It could be opening a sewage plant, but as long as the president is doing it, it is the top story. Uh, and Russia, I think, as I say, acts in lockstep with others who take the same view, I think, of, of, president, of, of centralized uh, authoritarian power, or authoritarian in different ways. China, obviously, to which um, Russia is much, much closer. It had, of course, been almost an enemy for much of the Soviet period, or for large parts of the Soviet period. It fears and still does fear the encroachments of Russia into the Far East. The Russian part is, is largely empty. The Far East, if you, under one definition, is that space bigger, considerably bigger than Europe. Uh, not just one country of Europe, but Europe itself, with 6,000 people in it. Um, so it's pretty empty, uh, but the Chinese are grasping after more Lebensraum and are beginning to filter across and have many, many now um, deals and contracts with the, the Far East and, and uh, with the governance of Vladivostok. Um, in Russia, too, since Xi Jinping took over, you've had the imprisonment of many, many of the human rights lawyers closing of NGOs, Chinese and uh, foreign-sponsored, and a stamping on journalism, which had been actually quite active. Uh, lots of investigative journalists, um, many of whom have come to this thing I started in Russia called the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Many have come there, young Russian journalists, uh, Chinese journalists who want to do to do real journalism, want to analyze, investigate, and reveal, uh, but are now essentially stopped from doing that. Many of them fired. None of them put in prison. It's not gone back to the Mao days, but, it's, um, but they can't do that kind of journalism anymore. At the same time, he's made a, he successfully, I think, I'm no sinologist, but he's successfully tackling corruption, which was threatening the party itself, but he's, he's brought the two together. He's brought Western influence and corruption together and, and presents them as, in some way, the same thing. In Turkey, um, uh, um, President, um, previously Prime Minister Erdogan, has explicitly taken a leaf out of um, uh, Vladimir Putin's book. They're, they're friends. Um, they see each other, not all the time, of course, but a fair amount, seem to talk a bit. Um, and. He, too, has muzzled the press. He, too, has harassed NGOs. And although in the recent election it's shown that, that democracy, party democracy, is still pretty robust in, in, uh, in Turkey uh, and deprived him of the two-thirds majority, he would need to change the constitution to allow him to be a, a, an executive president. Still, uh, he's, he's going to still try to dominate and still does dominate the, 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 the Turkish society and politics. And in Hungary, um, Prime Minister Orban, who came in as a liberal, is now, like Erdogan, uh, friendly to Putin, like Erdogan and Putin and Xi Jinping, has muzzled the press uh, and has sidelined the opposition. So is there a question, really, and I think it is a question, it's not a statement, is there a new authoritarian international, not any longer a communist international, held together largely as it was by the Soviet Union. But is there an authoritarian international which has got no one center, but has got common approaches to society and to politics? Uh, India isn't part of it. India is the second largest country in the world, will soon be the largest. Um, Prime Minister Modi, although many think he is, uh, has got authoritarian tendencies, has not, it's probably impossible in India. 
uh, I mean, partly because the politics are so chaotic, but also because the, the, the division of powers uh, regionally among the states are such that no one person could dominate. Um, again, no Indian expert, but that seems to be, seems to be the case. The Middle East is too roiled by conflict, really, to uh, the, the state which has become very authoritarian um, is Egypt. Uh, under Field Marshal Al-Sisi, uh, who dethroned the President uh, Morsi, who was um, elected as the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, and whose rule was becoming increasingly threatening, um, but who was displaced, uh, is now sentenced uh, to death, I think, but it's under, under appeal. Yes, he has been, uh, the death penalty has been, been uh, leveled against him. Uh, probably not, it probably won't um, <laughs> happen. Uh, it's being appealed, and the thought is it'll be commuted to life imprisonment, um, but certainly he's out of it. And uh, uh, in Africa and South America, you have diverse, diverse movements this way and that. With Africa, many states in Africa are increasingly actually under Chinese influence rather than any other. So... The key person is in Russia is Vladimir Putin. Came to power in 2000, was a, uh, a colonel in the KGB. I was saying earlier that every time you hear about somebody in the KGB, they're always a colonel. You wonder, what, where are the lieutenants and the sergeants? Uh, everybody's a colonel. He was a colonel. He was in East, I think, a lieutenant colonel. He was in uh, East Germany when the Soviet Union collapsed in Dresden. And he saw a mob um, coming to, um, to attack, not his headquarters, but the headquarters of the German, the East German secret police, and did so and got files and so on, was horrified. Horrified, not just by what he was seeing, but by the collapse of political authority in his own country, and as clearly sees, as he said famously, this was the great geopolitical event of the 20th century. And although many can... There are many could quarrel with that. For him, I think it really was, because it was personal. He had, from a working class Leningrad background, had become a moderately successful KGB officer, and that which he'd been sworn to protect was, had collapsed. So he came to power, uh, ushered in by the oligarchs who were very powerful under Boris Yeltsin. Boris Yeltsin, by that time, rather ailing. Um, uh, and um, seen by the oligarchs as their man, a man whom they could trust. Um, they, people like Boris Berezovsky, Vladimir Guzinski, um, um, Vladimir Putanin, and many others, controlled not just the natural resources, especially the oil, but they also controlled the media, especially television. Uh, so they were the real powers in the land. So he came in. Um, he was lucky because around about the same time the oil price began to climb and kept on climbing through much of his rule. Although one has to say that although he benefited from that, he does no longer. Um, he, uh, he did not, he has not, and seems to have no intention to modernize the country's industry. Uh, an attempt to make a Silicon Valley near, in a place called Skolkova, near Moscow, has, has literally... Uh, disappeared into the, into the mud. He was right, I think, to assert the state. Any state which is, wants to, um, to be a responsible state, to reproduce itself, has to, in some things, be dominant. And, and the end of the Yeltsin state, um, the oligarchs, who had got hugely wealthy, in part by supporting Yeltsin in his second election by putting all of their media at his disposal uh, uh, and then by controlling the natural resources and the media of the country had become more powerful than the president, any functioning state could not endure that, whether it's democratic or authoritarian. So he had to uh, assert central political power. He did so. He called them in uh, and much to their amazement, surprise and chagrin said, I'm in charge. You can make money. You can keep money. Uh, but get out of politics. And if you don't, then you'll have to pay. And of course, someone did pay. Mikhail Khodakovsky, the richest, biggest oil baron, 
uh, and actually the most liberal, somebody who was already beginning to, to grasp for a new Russia, a new civil and democratic Russia, and put his money, including towards the, the school I was part of, but to other, um, other institutions, he took Putin on in, um, in the semi-public event, said that, that the Kremlin was corrupt, and then disappeared into, uh, into a prison camp for the next 10 years, which, from which he emerged only last year. And he's now flits between London, Geneva, and elsewhere. He's still got a few hundred million, nothing like what he had, but enough to keep body and soul together and, uh, and also to fund opposition, which he said he wouldn't, but he, but he is. It's also, of course, galling for any president, prime minister, to have foreigners in your country saying, this isn't the way you should run the country. Um, so that the NGOs, uh, both the Russian ones, which are sponsored by the West, and the Western ones themselves, were clearly not going to be popular. They weren't popular under Yeltsin. But they were uh, not just tolerated, but actually, in a sense, encouraged. People around the president, the Democrats, the reformers, uh, got irritated by the people coming over saying, you're doing it all wrong, but accepted that they were doing it all wrong, or they had much to learn, or they needed cooperation. Now it is simply seen as something which can no longer be tolerated and is tantamount to treachery, hence the word foreign agent. It's treachery. It is, it's, it's something which can no longer be born and thus must go. Finally, question to leave you with, is a reset possible? You will know that when President Obama came in as president of the US, uh, now it seems a long time ago, six, six years ago now, he tried, among other things, to get a reset with Russia because uh, relations were already worsening, they were better than they are now. Is it possible to have a reset? Is it possible to have this important country with a, uh, with a highly civilized people who have contributed so much to European culture, think literature, music, art, um, uh, and who, uh, even under Stalin, in a sense, saved our bacon. The Russians, the Soviets, lost millions, millions, tens of millions of people uh, in the Nazi invasion and in the war against, the, against Nazi Germany. And had they not, then um, probably Britain would have been overrun, and God knows what kind of Europe we would now have. We owe Russia historically a good deal. It would be much better for us in Europe to have good relations with a country which defines itself still, uh, by, certainly by the liberals, as a European country. But how, how can we have one? Well, it's very easy for journalists to say, this is what you should do because we don't do it. But um, one, you need a new deal in Ukraine, which may mean that that, that part, which is now under Russian control, would, would have to have substantial devolution, remain part of Ukraine, but very substantial devolution, as long, of course, as the Russians withdrew their, their military aid. Uh, you'd have to have, I think, a some kind of, um, some sort of um, commitment from NATO not to expand into Ukraine, at least, which um, I think NATO might resist, but probably would regard as necessary. As I say, NATO didn't promise Gorbachev. They did have discussions about, about it, but didn't promise. It may be necessary that at least for, say, a decade, NATO says it, it won't expand. Uh, you'd have to recognize, therefore, Russia's interests. But you also, crucially, have to have Russia recognize that Ukraine, like all the other 14 states of the former Soviet Union, are now independent sovereign countries. They are no longer part of the Russian Empire, however defined, and must go their own way as they wish. Uh, going their own way, of course, should not threaten Russia militarily, in, in a sense, and if they feel so, then there should be debate, discussion, and so on with Western powers. But they are sovereign states. And Mr. Yatsinuk, the, the um, Prime Minister of Ukraine, whose comments I read earlier, um, um, he may be right that, that's, that they're not doing that now. They must be brought to do it. And of course, they have to, regard, to see that they need to modernize the economy um, uh, because clearly they can't rely upon uh, oil, one which the demand is somewhat declining, 
it may go up again in the future, but it's declining at the moment. The price is low, and the price, like the people who, are, who want to make the country from which I come independent, Scotland, will be this, uh, has the same problem. It relies very much on oil. The SNP's uh, economic program assumed an oil price of $110, which was optimistic even then and is now absurd. Um, both Russia and Scotland have to, have to realize that that's no longer possible to rely upon that and come to some kind of modernization in which the West obviously could help, not so much in civil society and democracy, but in technology and in um, running a, a new, uh, running a complex society. That's a sketch of what I think must happen, but whether or not it can, whether or not it will under Putin or indeed under a successor who many people think may be more nationalistic than he is, I leave to you. Thank you. <clears throat>